I think this morning was a real special uh, half day, and uh, I, those of you who think uh, it's going to be downhill from here, uh, I think will uh, be surprised and delighted that uh, this afternoon I think is going to be just as much fun and uh, challenging some of our original belief systems on some things with some good current scientific data. Our next speaker, uh, I think we're real fortunate to have come uh, to address us. Uh, he made kind of a stir this past year in bringing out a, a new book, uh, which cites the work of uh, Dr. Weston Price's uh, research with uh, Charlie Mayo of uh, the Mayo Clinic and some of the other top researchers back in the 1920s and 30s, looking at uh, root canal therapy and how uh, that dental uh, procedure may have impact on the health of humans. And particularly after uh, hearing uh, uh, Gaston Nessans this morning uh, add some new insight onto what uh, Price saw back then. Dr. George E. Meinig uh, uh, received his Doctor of Dental Surgery from the Chicago College of Dental Surgery. He's a life member of the American Dental Association and the California Dental Association as well as one of the founding members of the American Association of Endodontists who love him dearly these days. Uh, he's also received fellowships from the American College of Dentists, the fellowship of uh, the Academy of International Dentistry, a fellow in the International College of Applied Nutrition, fellow of the Price Pottinger Nutritional Foundation, uh, fellow of the International Academy of Nutrition and Preventive Medicine, uh, who's who, and he has published a couple of other books and, and many other journal articles. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. George Meinick. Thank you very much. Uh, we can add one more thing. Am I coming across all right here with this? We can add one more thing. I, I need one of those pins because I became a member of this uh, fine organization about six months ago. <laughs> and uh, it, it may sound a little silly because I retired 11 years ago. And what am I doing in here because I'm not putting in any amalgams these days. And I'm not doing any root fills either. So a anyway, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. and. I'm going to get into telling you a little bit about how this all happened. Since my root canal cover-up book came off the press on June the 25th of 1993, that's last year, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure of meeting and talking to many of you out there uh, and, and other amalgam-free dentists around the country because many of you have called me. You've been most kind and receptive to my report of Dr. Weston Price's research. It's been gratifying to see how quickly you as a group have grasped the importance of, of his discoveries and how bacteria become trapped in dentin tubules and how this is a devastating health problem as is, as devastating a health problem as is the amalgam issue. As you heard, uh, I was one of the 19 founding members of the Root Canal Association some 51 years ago. And uh, that was quite a highlight because in those days, very few uh, dentists were doing root canals. In fact, there were a lot of schools that didn't even teach the subject. And I won't get into all of the story in back of that, but we were a small group, uh, 19 of us, who started the Endo Association. And the idea was not uh, an association of specialists, but was uh, supposed to be for the general practitioner because we were trying to encourage them to the fact that saving teeth was a worthwhile endeavor. And all our altruist, altruistic uh, uh, feelings have kind of uh, taken a blow since I, I published this book. But we still uh, want to find out how to save these teeth. And our theme in those days uh, that we learned from good old Ed Coolidge was uh, to tell dentists, how in the world can you learn how to save teeth by taking them out? And so <laughs> this is uh, uh, what we did. and we we. we <laughs> We went around, uh, Coolidge got us on programs. There were six of us in his study group. 
Uh, we had postgraduate work with him all one night a week, all one summer. And the premise was that we go out and teach endo. And, and so we, he got us on programs. And in those days, uh, if you had a table clinic or something of that sort, one, one table was a lot. But we had six of us each took a phase of, of endo. And uh, of course, the dentist would come by and say, oh, you guys are crazy. Take those teeth out. So anyway, that's how the Endo Association got started. And uh, it wasn't long before it really became more of an association of specialists rather than general practitioners, although some of the memberships is still general practitioners. And they're a little more apt to listen to my book uh, than the general members right now. Today, the American Association of Endodontists has 4,000 members. Last year, they estimate 24 million root canals were done. The number in actual existence is astronomical, and I have no idea what it is. Well, you can imagine the shock and astonishment and chagrin that I suffered when just two and a half years ago, after 47 years of practice, I discovered the long ago buried root canal research of Dr. Weston A. Price. Some of you may have known him because of his, he was famous for his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, but uh, I never heard a word of that business on uh, root canal uh, research, that 25 years that he did. And uh, I've talked to an awful lot of dentists since uh, this has all come about. And the only one that I've ever heard that knew anything about it was Ed Arana, sitting right here. So maybe more of you have heard of it, but you, you won't find very many. Uh, his 25-year research program on all the major phases of root canal therapy was so extensive and so intricate that I was devastated to never have heard or seen the slightest word about it. Since my reviewing of Price's work, I have talked to hundreds of dentists. As I said, I only found one who had ever heard of it before. In deciding to expose the cover-up of Price's work, I expected the American Association of Endodontists and members and uh, many of the other dentists in the country would uh, think I'd lost my marbles and that I might have uh, difficulty uh, uh, changing their uh, entrenched and prejudiced views. Well, I had no way of knowing how well you members of the Academy of Oral Medicine and the Biological Academy and the other amalgam free dentists uh, would quickly see the significance of Price's work. Now, I guess maybe all of you haven't, but, but a good proportion of you have because it was a pleasant surprise that so many of you, after reading of my exposure of the root canal cover-up, called or wrote and asked if discounts were offered on multiple copy purchases of my book. So <laughs> you could imagine that I said yes very quickly. Uh, what happened is you amalgam-free uh, dentists realized very quickly that that the chair time involved in telling people about this root canal problem was so extensive that it was much easier to have the book there and, and have them buy the book or give them the book and, and uh, uh, say, hey, if you don't want it after you get through reading it, I'll buy it back if you don't mutilate it a little way. And so, uh, so many uh, did support me in this way that uh, I can report that in seven months we sold out the first 3,000 copies that we printed. Well, that wasn't very many copies, but uh, I was happy that uh, we sold them out. At some time or other, I'm sure all of you have read stories or seen them portrayed in movies or on TV about the great medical discoveries of the past. Stories like those of Louis Pasteur and his great research about how bacteria cause disease. Uh, the story of Wa Dr. Walter Reed, who after long search uh, finally found that mosquitoes cause yellow fever, and there's hundreds of these. But the story about Dr. Price is not the usual one about a prolonged search for a difficult to find germ or virus that causes a devastating disease. No, his was an investigative research study that showed how numbers of different bacteria become entrenched inside the structure of teeth and end up causing a very high percentage of the chronic and degenerative diseases that are so epidemic in America today. Dr. Price's 25-year research program and the discoveries he made rank right up there with the greatest medical discoveries of all time. And we have to keep remembering most of them are medical discoveries, not dental ones. They originate dentally. 
One of the most important of his discoveries concerned how bacteria and teeth act much like cancer cells. You know, uh, cancers metastasize to other parts of the body. Well, these bacteria trapped in teeth similarly metastasize. And as they migrate through one system, they infect the heart, kidneys, the joints, the nervous system, the brain, the eyes. They can infect uh, pregnant women. And in fact, they can infect any organ, gland, or body tissue. In other words, root canal filled teeth always remain infected. Don't think for a moment this 25 year research program was in any way a commonplace small endeavor. Dr. Price was a noted <coughs> and honored dental research specialist. In pioneering these studies, he had a team of 60 of the nation's leading scientists working with him. Not only that, the last half of his research program was conducted under the American Dental Association and their research institute. At the time, it was called the Research Institute. Well, all of his uh, research is well documented. Are we, oh, better turn the projector on back there, I guess. Yeah, we'll find the focus here. I'm having trouble getting it everywhere. Uh, all of his research is well documented in two books that total 1,174 pages and in 25 articles that can be found in the medical and dental uh, scientific literature. Because uh, tooth decay and dental infections occur so commonly, it is easy to think of Dr. Price's work. Oh, what's happening? Not working. To the back. Well, I'm not making it work. Okay. Because tooth decay and dental infections occur so commonly, it is easy to think of Dr. Price's work as insignificant. However, the cover-up of his outstanding research uh, has kept the world from knowing about the staggering number of medical diseases that actually take place because of dental infections. It is easy for dentists and everyone else to think of these discoveries as being a dental problem, uh, but I want you to again remember that they, for the most part, they are medical. As with the, all the great medical discoveries in the past, there often comes along a brilliant experiment that proves to be an exciting study that sets the stage for all of the great accomplishments that were to follow. The, Dr. Price had been treating root canal infections in the early 1900s, and his root canal results were every bit as good as any that I have seen today. However, he developed the suspicion that these teeth always remained infected and at this particular moment, he had a patient for whom he had completed a root canal filling some 10 years earlier who had developed a, a severe arthritis. Uh, you can see from this slide that this woman was quite severe. She could get around basically only in that wheelchair. Actually, that middle picture was after she'd had the root filled tooth out and was starting to recover and was able to use crutches. Uh, what he did was uh, he had her in the office uh, on a morning and uh, he uh, removed the uh, tooth and after she left the office he had secured a laboratory animal, and in this case it was a rabbit, and uh, he implanted that uh, tooth under the skin of the rabbit and uh, lo and behold in uh, just uh, two days time the rabbit had the same infection, the same arthritis in its limbs as did the uh, uh, as did the uh, uh, patient. Uh, this is the tooth under the skin of the rabbit, and uh, this is what the rabbit looked like, uh, and he did uh, not only one case of this kind, they did uh, quite a few of them. Well, what this did was to validate uh, his feeling uh, that these teeth were infected, and so now he felt that uh, any person that had a severe degenerative disease 
that the medical profession was not able to solve, uh, and that it might be coming from a root-filled tooth. And so whenever one of those patients appeared on uh, his uh, office, why he would advise them to have the teeth, tooth or teeth removed, and he implanted them under the skin of the rabbit. And what happened was, almost in every instance, that, that uh, 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 rabbit got the same disease as the patient. In other words, if the patient had a heart problem, the rabbit got a heart problem. If the patient had kidney trouble, it was kidney trouble. If it was eye trouble, it was eye trouble. Whatever it was, it was usually the same disease. Once in a while, it wasn't the same one, but it was usually in a similar tissue, and it would be so like it that it was pretty much determined that it was the same disease. Well, in order to understand this, uh, I don't have to go into with a, with a dental audience the anatomy of teeth, but uh, find my pointer here. Uh, there is a couple of things to, to point out here. Uh, we know that the enamel only represents a, a small part of the tooth structure. The rest of the tooth, almost all of the tooth other than the cementum and the enamel is made up of dentin and that's over 90% of the tooth structure. You know, I think all of you dentists know that the that this is composed of little tiny tubules that you see represented here. Uh, those tubules, tubules in the normal instance carry a fluid and that fluid uh, carries nutriments that arrive from the bloodstream in the tooth and those nutriments are carried from there through to the outer edges in all parts of the tooth. And that's what keeps the tooth alive and healthy. Uh, <coughs> so what happens then when you develop caries in the tooth, as soon as the caries enters into the enamel of the tooth, incidentally, electron microscopes now show that the bacteria enter into the tubules, even if the caries hasn't gone through the enamel yet. Now, of course, when you get the infection of the actual pulp, now the bacteria that are traveling into this uh, root canal, they get into those dental tubules. And just uh, to get an example of how many of them there are, there's some 20 to 30,000 will fit in a 16th of an inch. But in a little more practical terms, if you took your smallest lower incisor tooth and strung those tubules out end to end, they would stretch for a distance of three miles. Now, three miles of those tubules being filled with bacteria, you know, have got billions of bacteria involved. And that's where the infection is, and that is why these teeth always remain infected. Now, Price, with the microscopes that he had at that time, this, this was a picture of the caries breaking through the enamel of the tooth and the, and the caries process going into the uh, dentin of the tooth. Here he's showing the dentin tubules, and those little black dots that you see there, those are bacteria. And at the time that he did this study, the dentists originally thought that these were just artifacts or dirt or some other thing. They didn't recognize them as bacteria. But eventually they found out that they were bacteria. Now, I don't know about you, but I never saw a picture of bacteria in dentin tubules uh, until two and a half years ago when I received his two books and saw this picture. Now, I suspect that the newer graduates have seen uh, electron microscope pictures of bacteria in dentin tubules, but I don't know, I don't hear anybody ever talking about it, so I don't think there are too many of you who have uh, done that. The question, uh, of course, going back to uh, uh, this tooth, uh, is how do those bacteria uh, escape? And uh, we have lateral canals here. Most teeth have lateral canals, and the bacteria that are within the vicinity at least can get out through the lateral canal into the periodontal ligament or periodontal membrane, and uh, thereon uh, infect the membrane, and from there infect the alveolar process, and from there the bloodstream in our alveolar bone will pick up the bacteria and transport them to the rest of the body. Price did a very interesting experiment among the many that he did do, he, uh, uh, at one time, I think I've got another picture of the tooth here. Now this, this uh, I'll get back to that. Uh, this, this electron microscope picture showing a dentin tubule, 
and how big they look in an electron microscope. Uh, this is a cross-section of them. You see how many there are, and this is longitudinally. These are the bacteria in the, in the uh, dentin tubules. And you can see by their size that you could have six across there very easily. Uh, so you can imagine how many are present in, in those tubules. Uh, here's another tooth, so you can see the periodontal membrane a little better. And getting back to his experiment, uh, he had found the bacteria, of course, came through here very well. He could, he could uh, check that out uh, with uh, a variety of ways. But uh, he did a, a, an experiment where he put a steel tube in an extracted tooth that had no caries in it. And he uh, attached a, a, a tube of water to it and a pump. And he pumped water into the root canal under pressure. And he put a little uh, dye in it so that you could see what happened. And that dye went through all of the cementum of the tooth, which showed that the cementum was a semi-permeable membrane and would permit liquids to go through. In other words, it would permit the toxins of the bacteria, which were in liquid form, to go through the cementum. And so that's exactly what he found. Well, then he still had to prove that. And so he, he took and, and uh, isolated the bacteria and then the toxins that came from here. Uh, he put it in a... Uh, centrifuge and in a Birkfeld filter and, and was able to separate the bacteria and the, and the toxins into two different vessels. Now he took the bacteria and he planted the bacteria in some rabbits and by golly the rabbits got the same disease as of course the patient had. Well then he took the toxins and he did the same thing and they got the same di disease as the rabbits had. Well uh, the interesting part of that was that that from the toxins, they got the disease quicker and died sooner than they did from the bacteria alone. So he had often said that he thought that the, the, the toxins were more dangerous, but this was finally proof of what he was uh, talking about. This is how it all, all got started for me. <coughs> for me. Uh, this uh, young girl, 19-year-old girl, had uh, an auto injury and had these nerves and blood vessels uh, severed at the end of the roots of the tooth and eventually the area became infected because of bacteria in the bloodstream. Doctor, uh, this, this happened uh, at the end of my junior year. I uh, was fortunate enough to have completed both my junior and senior year of root canal requirement. And my classmates all said, well, lad, George, that's because you expose more pulps than anybody else. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> At any rate, uh, Dr. Coolidge, who was in those days the, the top man in the world in, in root canal therapy, his uh, first uh, section and slide showing healing and repair of a periapical involvement is the classic that appears in all root canal books today. Uh, he came to me and he said, George, he said, I hate to ask you this because I know how tough the requirements are to get out of dental school. But he's had this girl with these four infected teeth, and none, nobody in your class has had enough experience to really ta tackle it. But if you will, I'll give you some hand with it. So uh, I, of course, said yes, I'd be glad to. And it was a result of that that a couple of years later I was asked to be in his study group. At any rate, uh, I, I at that time didn't know that I was going to be uh, giving a lecture here. <laughs> this many years later, and I wasn't smart enough to get a follow-up picture of the root canal fillings, and, the, and I don't think uh, she was back to get a, a follow-up of that by the time I graduated. But that's the way I kind of got really involved. This isn't the same case, but it's one similar showing right after root canal filling, the healing in the uh, uh, abscess area, and uh, here, we, uh, here's, here it is after the healing and the filling in of bone, and uh, here we have another very large area of, of uh, infection uh, here, and the dentist starting his root canal uh, treatment, and uh, this is right after the root canal filling, and this is a roughly about a year later showing the filling in of bone. Now, you can see how hard it is for we dentists and even the patients to look at that healing and repair and say, how in the world can we have that kind of healing and repair and still have infection present in these teeth. So uh, this, is, this is where part of our problem is wrapped up. Well, 
all of it's wrapped up, of course, in what we're trying to say that our best thing to do today is prevention. And of course, if you're going to have a cavity, you ought to prevent it in the first place. If you're going to have a cavity, you ought to get a little cavity when you can have a little filling and you don't have the risk of a root canal. And of course, it is a shame uh, to have to uh, face the forceps. I, I saw this uh, statement and I thought, boy, oh boy, how that applies to crisis work. Nothing more frightful than ignorance and action. This is, this is an extracted tooth under the skin of a rabbit. Several dentists came to Dr. Price and said, oh, any tooth you put under the skin of a rabbit will cause it to be infected and he probably would die. And so Price said he wasn't sure about that either. So what he did is he went out and he secured 100 healthy teeth. That was teeth that were extracted for orthodontic purposes or teeth that were uh, uh, extracted for uh, uh, impactions. And he implanted each one under the skin of an animal. And each one, you know what happened? Not a thing. Those animals continued to live their normal lifespan. And uh, they showed no sign of problems. Occasionally, one of these teeth would actually exfoliate through the skin. Their defense mechanisms would do that. Occasionally, one would dissolve away uh, and, and just disappear. But the vast majority developed kind of a little cystic sac around them. And when Price would go back in later and, and, and uh, take those teeth out and do a bacteriologic study, they were always sterile. They never found any bacteria. And the rabbits lived a full life uh, without any problem. So that answered part of the problem. He also did uh, coins. This is a dime. And he, he did uh, pieces of glass and pieces of metal. And nothing happened. You know, people get shot and have bullets in them for years. And, and even though it's lead, <laughs> they, they seem to tolerate them pretty well. Uh, now I'm going to show you some pictures of what happened to rabbits under a variety of conditions. Uh, this is a, a myocarditis uh, that occurred in this rabbit, the uh, heart of a, uh, of a patient that uh, had myocarditis. And when he implanted the tooth under the skin of the rabbit, the rabbit developed my myocarditis. This is endocarditis in another rabbit. Uh, that tooth was from a patient who had endo endocarditis. Uh, we mentioned eye trouble. You can see here that this eye is highly inflamed. This uh, patient was giving her oculus and her physician uh, headaches because it was over two months' time and they weren't getting anywhere treating it. And finally, her dentist was good enough to take some x-ray pictures. And you don't see it too clearly on these pictures, but she had an involvement periapically there and here and here. He took all three of those teeth out and they were implanted in three different rabbits. The first one almost went blind uh, within just a few days and uh, eventually died. And, and most of these rabbits uh, died in anywhere from two days to two weeks' time. Uh, most animals uh, don't die that quickly. Rabbits just happen to just, uh, react quicker. Uh, the other two rabbits went blind uh, within a couple of days. And uh, uh, so you see how serious these infections could be uh, to a rabbit. Well, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. And that's sure true it is. <laughs> This is a case of kidney trouble. This patient uh, whose tooth was removed and put in a rabbit. Uh, this is the rabbit's uh, swollen kidneys. This is a normal size kidney for a rabbit. And so you can see how enlarged and engorged those are. These are the cell pictures showing the fat cells that uh, we heard from uh, uh, Gaston Hassan today, that fat cells are very often involved in these uh, areas. Uh, you just see how, how severely involved is a tooth. This is a bladder infection. This is a perforation of the bladder. This rabbit died because uh, urine escaped into the abdominal, the abdominal cavity. And uh, this is another uh, rabbit uh, with a, a bladder infection uh, uh, coming from a patient. And you can see how swollen that bladder is uh, uh, there for that rabbit. Uh, here we have a fistula on this young boy coming from a lower first molar that was infected. One of Price's studies, he studied all kinds of things in root canal therapy. And one of the things he studied here was the amount of bacteria coming from the pus coming from this fistula. And he found that from all fistulas, the actual amount of bacteria in the pus was very small. There was some bacteria there, but it was minute. And you know, all of us think that those are the worst infections you have. When you've got a fistula, boy, that's a bad one. Well, uh, actually, what he found was that the bad ones were where you had condensing os osteitis. 
around the end of the root, and you didn't have much of an area of bone loss around the end of the root. But the condensi osteitis, he, he felt, was due to nature's and your body's attempt to contain the infection so it wouldn't spread so much. And these didn't spread because the pus was escaping. This is another fistula here and here. You don't have one here because the pus is draining through the tooth itself. Well, Santiana said life is a predicament, and I guess we found that out from this work. Things do not happen in this world. They're brought about, said William Hayes. But the thing that uh, Price was very deaf on is he wanted to know the cause of everything. And here Bacon said, to know truly is to know by causes. This is another fistula, but in this case, it came from this uh, uh, lower molar that was extracted. And I don't know whether it came after the extraction uh, from an infected socket or came from the tooth, but uh, this is not a bacterial infection. In this case, this is a uh, amoeba. Uh, this is a, a, a parasite infection. And Price found that the bacteria, in doing bacteriologic studies, and they had bacteriologists, but he wasn't any slouch himself at that, uh, they found over 20 different organisms, most of them streptococcus, but they could be staphs, they could be uh, uh, spirochetes, they could be parasites. And uh, uh, the vast majority, 65% of the ones that he did were streptococcus faecalis. Interestingly enough, just last year, there was a report in a dental journal that the most frequent dental infections come from streptococcus faecalis. You still think I'm an alarmist? One more. This is the testicles of a man that had uh, severe swelling in his testicles and a lot of pain. And uh, he had three root-filled teeth, so they took the three out and implanted them under each of three rabbits, and these are the three rabbits. And you know those are swollen because this is the normal size testicle for a rabbit. Now, uh, this is, uh, this is a, I'm going to get into uh, cavitations. I think you'll recognize that this is a pretty good cavitation area. And uh, uh, Michael LaMarche, who's here with us today, he sent this to me uh, and show, to show me uh, this one that he picked up in his practice. And he's done lots of these now. Uh, and to show how deep it was, he took a round burr. And I didn't, he had this off of a handpiece and he just pressed the alveolar crest, and the, there was so little bone there that it sunk right into the hole. And he just did that so you could see how deep it was. So this wasn't a hole that he drilled in there. He, this just went in by pressure. And now, one of the big surprises of my life, and, and what you never know where, where your life is going to go, <coughs> this is my wife. <coughs> Uh, this first molar I removed in 1940. The, I'm the fault of that piece of amalgam, but I'll tell you, in those days, very few dentists had vacuum equipment in their office. We mopped up with gauze. And even today, when you, with all our fancy uh, evacuation, you know how many of these things you find. So uh, at any rate, if you look closely, you see this area here. That's a cavitation. And I saw that thing there for ever since 1940. I don't know how many different dentists and oral surgeons I showed it to, and they all said, oh, that wasn't anything. It was all right. No problem. Anyway, in October of this year, this bicuspid started to swell up some. And uh, so we arranged to have that removed. And uh, the dentist, I was given to understand, uh, knew about removing cavitations, and I wanted him to do this, to remove this root-filled tooth, which I did in 1970, and it was beginning to show a breakdown here. And we weren't so sure that this wasn't cavitation here, but Elner never had a third molar there. In fact, she only has one, that one over there, the other three she never had in the first place. So we said, ah, oh, that's our imagination, that can't be a cavitation. Well, anyway, uh, after uh, the, the dentist uh, removed this tooth, he did the protocol quite well here. But when he got into here, I realized he really uh, wasn't what he cracked up to be. 
as far as knowing how to remove cavitations. And I, of course, didn't know anything about it, but it just seemed to me he wasn't getting at the heart of the trouble. He ran into one area where there was an amalgam tattoo, and he thought he had this piece. And I said, God, it can't be. It wasn't, it wasn't enough. It was just in the tissue. And uh, anyway, uh, two days later, my wife developed a, a, a post-herpetic uh, stomatitis from an area that where she'd had uh, shingles uh, 20 years before. She didn't break out with it, but she had all the same pain under her left breast and around her back. And I thought it was because he didn't get all the infection out of here that, uh, that, that was the problem. We're not sure that's so now. And there's several other things. Anyway, I eventually got hold of Chris uh, Husser. I don't know how many of you know him. He has now done over a 1,000 of these things. And uh, I took a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, because I decided about time I had somebody that knew what they were doing. And uh, she was supposed to have this done on a Wednesday. Uh, come uh, Wednesday, her blood pressure had gone up at 7,500 feet there in, in uh, New Mexico, where he is. And so he said, we can't do that today, but I will come down to the office on Saturday to do it. And so we said, OK. But he said, there's one problem. I don't have an assistant. My assistant's going to be taking some boards. And so I said, well, how about me? I'd done a lot of surgery in the past, and so I and I'd done all of her dentistry, particularly through the years. So. Uh, he said, sure, if I can stand him, he could stand me. And so I ended up the assistant. And it was the best thing that ever happened because now I knew firsthand what's, what goes on here. Well, the first thing he did was go into the third molar area. And there was actually three distinct areas of cavitation in that area. Uh, we don't know exactly why it occurred there. I, we think that it's probably from the remnants of the old tooth bud uh, that never developed. At any rate, the mandibular nerve it, the infection was all around it, and it was quite a task to, to tease away all of the bacteria and the dead bone cells and the fat cells and what have you around that mandibular nerve. And there it hung, waving in the breeze like a hawser off of a ship tied to the dock. And <laughs> it was kind of scary, but uh, uh, I, I could see why Husser was good, because he, was, he, was, he, he did everything very carefully. He removed this tooth. Surprisingly, I thought there'd be a lot of infected tissue here. There was practically none in, that so in those sockets. Uh, and I have the, uh, uh, the Dr. Bocot's uh, biopsy reports, if any of you want to see about this case uh, in the past. Then he got into this cavitation area. And here again, the mandibular nerve was exposed and waving in the breeze. And he had it teased around. And that piece of amalgam was embedded in the nerve sheath. So, you know, it was a delicate thing. It took up about two hours and a quarter. And uh, Elner had a little swelling, not too, too much. Uh, uh, numb lip for, it's almost completely gone now. And she's here if anybody wants to talk to her about it. Uh, over here, if you look closely, you see that it looks like a cavitation there and another one there. Uh, this was done uh, two or three months ago. Uh, before he put an anesthetic in here, he suspected this tooth might be bad. Now, why he did, I don't know. It didn't have show any trouble. But uh, he cut the bridge off and pulp tested that tooth, and it uh, was non-vital. And so he removed uh, that one in the cavitation area. He's removed this tooth, and then there also was a cavitation area here. And he removed that. We haven't gotten to these two upper ones. You see them here and here? And uh, that's on the slate in the next month or two. But uh, you can see that uh, maybe the good lard was with me or something, <laughs> direct, directing me into this kind of thing, because uh, I, I don't know that I'd ever known this, that, that this existed if I had not gotten involved with this uh, a couple of years ago. Now, uh, all of us dentists have seen patients with the dentulous areas where we see these little areas like this. These are cavitations. And <clears throat> A lot of you know that, but the question is, where does it come from? Well, we think it comes from the remnants of the periodontal membrane, and that the periodontal membrane and the first millimeter or so of alveolar process uh, is not uh, taken away by macrophages and the healing process uh, during the healing of that wound after the tooth was ex uh, extracted, and it leaves this infected area. And uh, you, you're all going to want to know about uh, Dr. Jerry Bacot, 
Uh, I was going to ask him to stand up, but I don't know. Jerry, where are you? Stand up so they can you know, tell where, where you are. Right there. Uh, he's the pathologist, is now uh, has dentists from 33 states sending uh, biopsy reports of these. Any of you dentists who are doing these, you better get biopsy reports because uh, if, if one of those patients has trouble and decides to sue you, they're going to say, what's your evidence that these things are infected or that you have infection in there like this? And they're not going to believe it. So you better have a biopsy report that shows the bacteria, shows that these things, for the most part, are uh, a low-grade osteomyelitis infection, a chronic osteomyelitis infection. But he'll tell you what's in there and, and, and everything about it. So get a hold of him and, and see that you get his uh, uh, information. You all have heard that uh, the papers now about the, the bacteria, the streps that are eating the skin away of people. There was another one about uh, a couple of children with the measles that uh, uh, I think one even died and several almost died uh, because of the uh, mutation of, of uh, bacteria. I didn't mention, but what happens uh, in when the bacteria get in the dentin tubules and you do a root canal filling, you suspect that because of the turning off of air and it's closed off and the, there's no food supply that these bacteria would die off. Well, they don't. They're polymorphic, and they, they are able to learn to exist and to grow in spite of lesser amounts of food and in spite of uh, all kinds of changes in their, in their uh, ab habitat. Uh, and I rather suspected that, that maybe uh, these things that we were seeing, maybe these people also had root canal fillings. And so we had one of these appear in the paper that occurred 50 miles away, and so I sent the physician a book and a letter and said, hey, it'd be interesting to know whether that patient had a root canal filling or not. And as you might suspect, I've never had an answer from him. Uh, this is another one of the great Price studies. Uh, in the beginning, he didn't know where the infection was in the tooth. He just suspected they were infected, so he implanted the whole tooth. Eventually, he cut the tooth into pieces, and he put pieces of tooth in the, under the rabbit's skin. And eventually, he ground them up into powder, and he put the powder in or injected the powder. And each time, the animal got sick just the same as with the whole tooth. Well, in this case, uh, this rabbit got the same disease as the uh, uh, patient had and died. And so he took that piece of tooth out, and he put it in a, in a vessel of boiling water, and he boiled that for one hour's time. He then took the piece of tooth out of that water, he planted it under another rabbit, and lo and behold, the rabbit got the same disease, not quite as fast, but he got the same disease and died just the same as the previous one. So now he takes another one and takes this piece of uh, tooth out uh, after the rabbit dies, and he puts it in a hospital auto autoclave at 60 pounds pressure, and lo and behold, when he takes it out of there and plants it under the animal, the animal gets sick and dies. And then he does this one in an autoclave at 300 pounds pressure. And this one got sick and died, not quite as fast as the others, but nevertheless got sick and died. So this brought up the big question. When I saw this and after went through it and I had, I had known about Masson's work, I'd had his book, and it suddenly dawned on me one day, are we dealing with somatids here? Because certainly this, this heat sterilization should have killed any bacteria that were present. We trusted to do it on our surgical instruments and everything else, but how come these teeth still cause infection? Now, or is it that, or is it the toxins of the bacteria? Just what is it? And I met with uh, an Assam this morning, and we talked about this, and, and he wasn't familiar with the dental things, but I gave him a copy of the book, and he's looking into things. We had a very interesting breakfast this morning talking about this. Well, the American way of life is, I guess, hazardous. We, as dentists, would, would say that. Uh, before I get into finishing this up, I uh, don't know where we are in time here. Yeah. Uh, I, I should tell you about why this, why this work of prices was buried. It all derived really because of the focal infection theory. 
you're all aware that you have an infection someplace in the body and then the bacteria there are transferred to another tissue, that's a focal infection. Well, Dr. Uh, Frank Billings in the first decade of this century uh, was the one that uh, announced uh, the, the theory of focal infection. By 1914, Dr. Billings had done enough research that he claimed that 95% of all focal infections came from teeth and tonsils. Well, <coughs> uh, that set up a whole situation and of course set up why one of the reasons why Price decided to implant that tooth of the arthritic patient. And there were other physicians in the country uh, and other people who were, were reading this and they were doing similar studies. But Price was the only dentist that was involved and he was trying to find out what was involved dentally. The others were just trying to find out what happened medically and so there was a lot of co-things going on. Like with all new theories, there were believers and non-believers. And you know, in the history of medicine, there's always been a problem of getting people to accept new theories. So this was part of the problem. And by the World War I days, uh, a fair number of, of physicians who had heard about arthritic patients getting better having teeth out were ha ordering uh, teeth out. They were even ordering sound natural teeth out and I had that experience even in the 30s when, uh, when I got into practice that physicians were telling people with good teeth to have them out because they believed so much in the focal infection theory that they thought any tooth was a bad problem. So uh, this, uh, this, this kind of was tilting the, the scale a little bit of, for making, making physicians and dentists uh, think uh, twice about the focal infection theory. But along came an MD who didn't, uh, decided he didn't like Price and he was too efficient or something. And he did an experiment where he isolated some Streptococcus bacteria from the saliva. He grew them in culture. He injected those, those uh, uh, Streptococcus under the skin of rabbits and in, in the body of the rabbits and nothing happened to the rabbits. Uh, so he promptly wrote an article that was published in a second grade journal that uh, stated uh, that Price was a fraud, that uh, there was nothing to the focal infection theory, it was a lot of baloney, and uh, that uh, uh, that, uh, coupled with the other things, uh, kind of tipped the scales as far as opinion was concerned. And at that, up to that time, Price was one of the most sought of speaker, sought of speakers in the country, both by physicians and dentists, and even by, by lay people as well, of course, but he was on programs all over the country continually uh, with work he was doing, but suddenly the invitations <laughs> stopped. The sales of his two volumes of books stopped. And so there wasn't a definite cover-up. It, it was a cover up because of these various factors that took place. And so when I heard about this, uh, I, 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 I tried to piece this together and price in those two books tells how much he was persecuted even during the time he was doing this and that it, he, he lived through a lot of tough days because of it. And so the American way of life is hazardous, but you can do something about it. And the way, of course, and the real theme for all of this is to stop the caries problem in the first place. And <coughs> that's possible uh, by good dietary, and I'll tell you that it's it's possible enough. I got involved in nutrition very early in my practice, and it took us eight years to learn how to stop the caries process. My wife has one tooth without a restoration. All of my posterior teeth had restorations. My two girls, <clears throat> I thought I was the toughest guy in the world, boy. We didn't let them have hardly anything. And they both had caries at the age of three. Uh, anyway, after we finally got the message thoroughly across. None of us had a carious tooth in 25 years. Uh, good food, good protein, these are fi three different kinds of fish. Poultry, you gotta have protein or you're not gonna get anywhere. And one of our big problems, as most of you know, are refined grains. I had heard from numbers of nutritionists that uh, a good self-respecting mouse or rat wouldn't eat our breakfast cereals uh, unless he, it was the only food in his cage for three or four days in a row. 
And so uh, finally one day it got the best of me and I was about ready to uh, uh, go to the market and buy a can of a box of cornflakes and I decided I'd better not seen, be seen with the cornflakes because <laughs> too many patients knew of my attitude about them. So I set one of my staff to do that. And we had this room off of our garage that uh, we used for storage and it had uh, mice droppings in it. We had ants by the billions going through there all the time. And so I just dumped this cornflakes on the table. Well, uh, this was, whoop, I lost my place here. Uh, if, if you look closely, that's the feces of the mice. This is eight months after I put the cornflakes on the table. <laughs> I, I could show you the first picture, but it doesn't look any different. <laughs> So I think you'd just think I was showing you the same slide over again. But it actually didn't, and I kept it there for almost a year, went through the heat of the summer and the cold of the winter and the ants going by, and none of them ever touched a thing. <laughs> so if, if that's what you want for breakfast, why, I wouldn't suggest it. <laughs> well, part of the thing I got involved with in, the, in nutrition was that I was asked to do uh, become a columnist in our local paper. And so for 17 years, I wrote a column called Nutritionally Speaking, where I answered questions on nutrition that people wrote in. And we took uh, 200 of the, of the most frequent asked questions and put them into book form. And uh, I had the privilege of studying with most of the top leaders in the applied nutrition field over the years. And so my interpretations of a lot of things are a little different than what you're accustomed to hearing. Uh, most, most people that get involved in nutrition have uh, a good experience in something and they base all of their nutritional background on that one experience. Well, I fortunately had experience in a lot of different areas, studied with a lot of different people like you know, Emmanuel Cheraskin and, and uh, Harold Hawkins and numbers of others. Anyway, that's, that's what that's about. The, this is one of my articles, it was printed in 1977. Uh, most of the things that are in my book are, are, are the thoughts of somebody else that I am telling you about. This is the only one that's original in the book, and I don't think I should take time to go into it today, but if you want to ask me about it, I'll, I'll tell you about it. But uh, it, it's one that can be helpful to you. Here comes Dennis the Menace, and he says to his friend, Hey, if you're thirsty, you never want to stop at the Minies and ask for a drink. They'll give you water. <laughs> this is a little aside from our, our, our backer, but there's enough of this going around the country. I thought you might like to know about it. Uh, you know, formaldehyde is a big problem in buildings today. All your cabinets are that way. All the, all the plywood has got formaldehyde. Uh, this woodwork here had formaldehyde. We moved into this house, it was a 10-year-old house, and we put new carpeting in on the floor, and I was stuffed up from the time we moved up. I couldn't breathe through my nose. And I had come across a report by NASA of a program they did because they were investigating what to do about the bacterial problem in, in the spacecraft. And this branched off into a whole big program by NASA of what to do in dental office, not dental offices, but all kinds of offices, and in homes, because our locked-in, non-air uh, circulating problem creates a lot of bacterial growth and, and problems, and some of it comes from formaldehyde. Well, I suspected the formaldehyde in this carpeting, and when I heard about this, one of the, oh, what they did was they, they had a box, big box with formaldehyde in it, and they uh, measured the amount over a period of time so knew the, they knew the box wasn't leaking. They put a, a spider plant, this is a spider plant, inside that box and in a reasonably short period, I think it's like a half a day or a day, 80% uh, of the formaldehyde in that box disappeared. Well, in 10 days after I hung this plant up in the bedroom, I was breathing again. <laughs> so I, I thought you ought to know that uh, it, it's not a bad idea to write to NASA and find out about this program because there's all kinds of things from plants. Uh, they take out benzene, they take all kinds of things that come from your clothing that you get clean, uh, and that's different kinds of plants, but uh, you ought to have a few plants around the house to help with uh, this kind of thing. There's another thing that's become amazing, and that's the grapefruit seeds. They are 
antibacterial, and you're, you find them in a lot of different things. Uh, I got involved with that because of the dust mites and so on in the house, because both my wife and I were having a problem with that. And I got involved with this company with this, this uh, air purifier, uh, which uh, sprayed uh, uh, the uh, grapefruit seed mash into the room, which killed the ba bacteria and the dust mites. My assistant that does my typing and, and uh, computer work did this for Christmas for me. Health is true wealth, and I thought I'd uh, want to leave a message with you all, and I want you all to be very wealthy people. Uh, nutrition and physical degeneration. I mentioned it earlier. You'll notice Western A. Price, the same Western A. Price who did the root canal research. Now, I knew all about this and was a member of the Price Flattinger Foundation. I have been for 20 years uh, and a board member for a good part of that. Uh, but I never heard about this root canal stuff until two and a half years ago. And I should have heard about it, but somehow or other it escaped me. I thought I'd seen all of this stuff. At any rate, this is a one of the great nutrition books of all time. And he's famous for this book. And many a nutritionist has gotten his start by reading this book. Uh, and so I won't get in, into the, the problem in the back of it, but it's a worthwhile one for you to uh, have. Uh, that's their address. They have a booth out here, you know, that the, uh, this organization was kind enough to give them uh, without cost uh, because it's a charitable nonprofit organization. Uh, well, incidentally, they have a they have a list. They, they want uh, every dentist who is doing uh, root canal removal protocol and doing cavitations uh, to uh, sign up out there because uh, they get many calls for referrals. And uh, uh, I'm the same way, so I will get it from them if you will do it. I've been asking those of you I meet if you do these things, and I've been grabbing your cards to add them to my list. Because the one big problem of having introduced all of this is where to send people uh, who have these troubles. And so uh, go by and visit the uh, Price Fodinger uh, booth. booth. 25-year research discloses the largest number of diseases ever to be traced to a single cause has come from root canal filled teeth. You know, the vast majority of diseases, one bacteria causes one disease. Here we have in the mouth whole flock of diseases that come from maybe 20 or 30 bacteria, but they're all centered in our, in our teeth or in our tonsils. We can't forget those tonsils. Well, I want to thank you all for being a great audience and being so attentive. And, and uh, I, th this is my home. I might, I might tell you, if most of you have heard that uh, I managed the dental office at 20th Century Fox Studio. And you should know that the reason I got that, uh, California dentists had their nose out of joint at a Chicago, and uh, I practiced in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, got the chance to be the manager of that new dental office that was put in Shirley Temple's old bungalow. Well, uh, the reason I got it, I didn't find out right away why I was asked to come in for an interview. I found out later that it, my, the reason was my work with uh, root canal therapy and nutrition. And so, uh, I, I spent a year and a half in the Beverly Hills area at the studio, and but we, my wife and I and our family discovered this beautiful valley, and we decided we didn't like uh, Los Angeles and Beverly Hills that well, so we moved, and all of the dentists thought I had lost my marbles, but <laughs> because of giving up that good opportunity. But uh, our life has been uh, fantastic, and if any of you get a chance to travel through here, we'd be delighted to have you see us. Uh, this, uh, this valley is the valley, if you've seen the picture Shangri-La that they, that they showed when they uh, got through that long trek through the snow and ice in the mountains. Uh, it, it's three mile, it's uh, 85 miles south of Santa, uh, uh, Los Angeles, 35 miles north of Santa Barbara. And uh, so sometime you're wending your way there, I'd be glad to see you. Are we going to have time for questions here now? Yes. Uh, we were supposed to do that, and, and uh, uh, so if any of you have any questions, we can have the lights back on.
And uh, just to give you a little background on uh, Dr. Pojan, uh, he uh, received his uh, Bachelor in Science from Brown University, his Master's and PhD from the University of Rochester. Uh, received advanced training in the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford, uh, School of Medicine, uh, Department of Biology at MIT, and the Department of Biology at the University of California, San Diego. He has uh, a long and illustrious career in academia, and uh, he uh, started off uh, as an instructor of uh, pharmacology at Vanderbilt, um, also uh, was a research fellow at the, in the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford University School of Medicine, uh, professor at the uh, Department of Microbiology at Tufts up in Massachusetts, also uh, was a, a professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Pharmacology at the University of Maryland, uh, then went on to uh, professor at the uh, University of Arizona uh, here at the Department of Pharmacology. It sounds like you've had trouble holding a job, Baz. Is that okay? <laughs> um, and he's still a visiting professor at the MIT, and it just uh, goes on and on. Uh, uh, but he is now a professor at uh, the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology and just a wonderful guy. Uh, Dr. Vazipozian, we're really happy to have you here. Come on. Hello. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for the invitation to join you and to discuss uh, some of the problems we have and the work we've done with DMPS. Let me try this first slide first. There we are. Okay. Uh, Well, before I even get to the next slide, let me just, first of all, make a public apology to Dr. Michael Ziff. Uh, at the meeting last March, I guess it was, in uh, Tucson, as we were walking back to the parking lot, he invited me to, to your international meeting in Germany, and I said I would go, and then promptly forgot about it. And we were doing a study in Tampico when he called down there and said, where, where, what are your plans? And I again, forgot about it. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of people in this country that might call me an SOB, but uh, very few can ever say I've broken my word, and except in this case, because of senility, you know, the first, the second thing that goes is your memory, and you all know what the first thing is, all right? <laughs> Just a minute, it's eyesight, remember? <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Let's see, focus this. There, thank you. Most of you in your notebooks have, an, have, a, have the outline of the talk that I'm going to give to you, so I won't spend very much time going over this, but the main points I want to discuss with you are out outlined, and I'm going to spend some time when we get to it on the Tucson study, which we need volunteers for. Uh, then I'll tell you about some of the work we've done with DMPS, some of the pharmacokinetics, and if time allows, I want to discuss with you the legality of using DMPS. You can do it legally, although most of you, if you're using it now, are not doing it legally. Okay, what should be done when a human is poisoned with heavy metals and metalloids. First of all, the person should be removed from the site of exposure, if possible, from the environment. And second, he can be treated or she can be treated with a metal mobilizing agent, a chelating agent, or a metal complexing agent, if necessary. I have so many buttons to push here. What is a chelating agent or a metal complexing agent? By definition, a chelating agent forms a ring structure with a metal. 
the chelation is the incorporation of a metal iron, metal iron, into a heterocyclic ring structure. Metal complexing agent is a more general term which includes chelating agent. Now most of you want to remember from your biochemistry and your pharmacology at dental school that metal ions, especially heavy metal ions, just are not floating around and diffusing around in, in body fluids. They're usually tied up to a ligand, an endogenous ligand. They're tied up to a protein or some other compound. And when you give a chelating agent, that chelating agent will compete with that ligand for the particular heavy metal that the chelating agent is, desi is designed to chelate. The net result of this is that the metal ion will form a chelate structure with the chelating agent, and this chelating, ag this chelating agent metal ion complex is, is uh, more soluble than the endogenous ligand and the, and the metal. So what you essentially do with the chelating agent is to make that metal ion in a more so water-soluble form. So Psychologists and pharmacologists met at the behest of the World Health Organization. And this table was put together uh, essentially to be passed around to the developing, the physicians in developing, uh, uh, in those developing countries that we could see that there was going to be a need for chelating agents. And essentially what I want to point out is the first choice here in almost every case is DMPS or DMP, uh, DMSA. The second choice is DMSA, DMSA, DMPS, dimer, capro, very unusual here, shouldn't, some question. Contraindication, dimer, capro, and EDTA. Both these compounds now are considered for a variety of reasons to be relatively unsafe for human use. That doesn't mean they're not being used, but the people who know, uh, who deal with these compounds, you might know dimer capro is BAL, or British Uh EDTA is in various forms and is now open to a lot of question. History of DMPS. DMPS was developed in the Soviet Union by a professor at the University of Kiev at the Sanitation Engineering Institute there by the name of Petrinkin. He developed this in the early 50s, and in 1958, DMPS became an official drug in the Soviet physician's armamentarium. It was developed, as most chelating agents with one or two ex exceptions, it was developed as an antidote for chemical warfare agents, in particular, in this case, lulocyte. It was unavailable to the Western world. We couldn't get it out of the Soviet Union when we went there. We could even find Petrunkin, a very talented organic chemist. He became a non-person very quickly in the Soviet uh, Union. It became available to the Western world in 1978. Uh, produced, manufactured by Heil in Berlin, and since then has been used in Germany uh, very effectively. It's registered with the German FDA as an antidote for mercury poisoning. It is a non-prescription drug. You do not have to have a prescription in Germany to buy the MPS. It's sold over the counter. And as I said, it was developed by Petrinkin in 1956 and 58 became a compound that was available to the Soviet physician. Two SH groups, very important for the chelation of, of metal ions. This compound and this compound, DMSA, are chemical analogs of British anti lewisite which was developed during the Second World War. Let me just tell you something about tox relative toxicities of these compounds. The data I'm going to show you on this slide is based on LD50s. That is the lethal dose that will kill 50% of the animals. It's a relatively outmoded kind of scientific designation today. You're not concerned about what's going to kill someone. You're more concerned now about a rash or an anaphylactic reaction of some kind. Of course, you don't want to kill them either. 
But essentially what you can see is that compared to British andulocyte, which is still used in this country, uh, DMSA is about one-tenth as toxic. The more of this compound you need for an LD50, the less toxic it is. Uh, DMPS is about half as toxic. Relatively safe drugs, as far as drugs go. All drugs, however, as you all know, do have toxic side effects. There's always a, the chance of idiosyncratic reaction to any drug. But as far as chelating agents are concerned, these two drugs are about the safest that we have. Diagnostic versus therapeutic. I'm going to turn this around, if I may, and talk about some of the therapeutic uses first, since most of the work that I'll be discussing is more applied to the uh, diagnostic. Advantages of DMPS. Advantages of DMPS. Extensive human experience, both oral preparations and intravenous and intramuscular pharmacokinetics have been done because both preparations are available. Most pharmacokineticists will tell you to do pharmacokinetics on a drug, which you can only give by mouth, involves a lot of assumptions. And those of us who have done this sort of work always try to get an IV preparation if it's available, and that is available for DMPS. It is not available for DMSA. Disadvantages, rare side effects, nausea, vertigo, skin rash, you see the same thing with DMSA. Therapeutic uses of DMPS, mercury, arsenic, lead, antimony, cobalt intoxication have all been successfully treated. The treatments have been documented in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Proved in Germany for the treatment of mercury intoxication, was most effective in the Iraqi mercury disaster. In this case, in, 19, in the early 19, in the late 1950s, the Iraqis were starving. The American, we sent over uh, grain seeds that they could plant to grow more grain, more wheat. Uh, we very carefully put on each hundred bag of seeds uh, a, a, the, the, the statement, poisonous, do not eat, in English. And our State Department, of course, did not realize that most Iraqi farmers are, are illiterate, even in, Arab, in Arabic, never mind uh, in English. The, Famine was so bad there that the farmers took these seeds and made bread out of it, ate it, and about 12,000 people were poisoned. About uh, 200 to 300 died, 6,000 were hospitalized. Uh, but DMPS was found to be very effective in relieving them of some of the very worst signs and symptoms. PO and parental uh, preparations available. It has been useful for Wilson's disease, which is a disease in which copper accumulates in the tissue. Now, let me point out to you, those of you who are interested, the time that it takes for a therapeutic regimen of DMPS to be useful. This is a study that was done in 1985 in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Tom Clarkson, of some, of whom, uh, some of you know him, uh, was called in to help in this and have the DMPS available. This is one of two people that was being poisoned by mercury vapor. Uh, this particular person had no symptoms, but his blood lead levels were very high. The other person, it was a much more complicated slide. I didn't want to bother with it. But essentially, when they began treatment at a level of 300 milligrams of DMPS a day, which they increased to 400 milligrams uh, per day, it took over 50 days. And even then, you haven't come down to a, the baseline that you'd like to come. So anyone who tells you that, take, that you should take a pill, one pill, one capsule of DMPS, or even one IV shot of DMPS, and you'll have all the mercury flushed from your body, uh, is sort of exaggerating, to say the least. This is the preparation that we use, Dimaval. It's made by Heil. We have the only IND investigational new drug permit in the United States given to us by the FDA. We are approved to do research with it. That doesn't mean other people cannot do it. Anyone who wants to study DMPS can apply to the FDA. It is not a difficult application. It's very simple. As long as you have a research protocol which has been passed by your institutional or some other internal review board, 
so that the FDA can then look through it, you'll probably be approved. The drug is considered to be relatively safe. What I want to point out at this time is that it is illegal in this country to use any drug that has not been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. I don't care what that drug is. If the drug is approved by the Food and Drug Administration for, let's say, pneumococcal infection, the physician has the absolute right to use it for any other purpose he wishes, because it is the physician who makes that decision if the drug has been approved by the FDA for any use. The formulation of the drug, the FDA protects its, our citizens against toxic, impure, uh, preparations, and this is why we have these rules and regulations. And I, again, I want to caution those of you who have used it or who are thinking about using it, uh, I want to caution you about the medical liabilities, and I also want to tell you it's easy to get an IND from the FDA. The more information we can have about the use of this drug by competent people in this country, the sooner the drug will be approved uh, by a new drug application. Tucson study, we want you, all right? Uh, again, this is written down in your outline, uh, and I'll go through two different preparations or two different ways of expressing it. And essentially, the Wallace Genetic Foundation has very kindly given, given us a substantial amount of money, money, there are enough money to research, you know that, but enough to cover uh, what we need to do, and we are going to examine the mercury load of general dental practitioners in Tucson, southern Arizona. We are going to compare those with the mercury load of orthodontists and periodontists, who I'm told never use mercury, but I'm no dentist, so I can be corrected. Uh, and we want someone in the middle. And guess who is in the middle? You. So we need you. And uh, we've talked with some of the people on your board, and we'll go through this study. It's not difficult. The only thing is you want to be prepared to fast for 11 hours. And in Tucson, with good steaks and beautiful beef, this might be a problem for some of you. <laughs> so let me go over the Tucson study for the IAOMT dentists. We are asking that you arrive in Tucson on Thursday. We don't want you to arrive on Friday and fast you immediately. We, we're asking that you arrive on, on, on Thursday at 8 a.m will begin a computerized neural behavioral test. This will tell us how fast you can move your fingers, how fast your mind can move as far as certain switching tasks are concerned. We are bringing uh, Di Dr. Diana Eshevara, who has collaborated with us on other experiments, down from the University of Washington. She'll show up with four Macintosh computers. You don't have to know how to use these computers. All you have to do is know how to press a button. And uh, all the tests are computerized. The, uh, we'll then, uh, for some of you, and I hate to ask this question, I know you're all mercury-free dentists, and remember the, the room is dark and I can't see you, and maybe everyone else will close their eyes so that your colleagues won't know, but do any of you have amalgams in your mouth at the present time? And if so, don't turn around, please. Really. <laughs> <laughs> this is confidential information, okay. Just uh, close your eyes. If anyone has a mouth, if you're a dentist and have amalgams in your mouth, would you please, just so I have an idea, all right, don't turn around. How many of you have amalgams in your mouth? Thank you for your honesty. Fine. Those people who have amalgams on their mouth, in their mouth, at no cost to you, I'm going to take you to my own friendly dentist, fantastic guy, and he'll do an amalgam score. He'll open your mouth in less than 10 or 15 minutes will be able to take the diameter of each of the amalgam surfaces in your mouth. This gives us an indication of how much mercury can come, come from your mouth, all right? And we need this for a variety of reasons. And we summate this to get the amalgam score. We'll have transportation available for you. At uh, 1 p.m., now this is a person, all right? There's going to be some changes here, which I'll tell you about in a moment. At 1 p.m., we'll begin the physical exam. We have two clinical toxicologists, both of whom are certified uh, board members or clinical toxicology boards, also certified physicians. They are also certified physicians uh, in emergency medicine. 
They've been working for, uh, with us since 1988. They're very good young people. Uh, they're, uh, they're fantastic. All right. They examine you so that we're certain that in case anything happens, uh, we have some data. Nothing has ever happened yet. We've done these studies a number of times. <laughs> uh, after the physical examination, you go back to your meeting or playing golf, whatever you're going to be doing on Friday. At 9 p.m. or 8 p.m., depending on what the final schedule is going to be, we'll ask you to begin your fast, fast and begin your 11-hour urine collection. You're in the hotel during all this time, all right? 6.45 a.m. the next morning, or we might start earlier at 6, we don't know, but after your 11-hour fast, some people will begin fasting at 8 o'clock, some people will begin at 8.15, 8.30, and this will be all scheduled. Uh, we, we take a blood sample for clinical chemistry. We have very sharp needles. Everyone does this on me first. They have to be sharp. Uh, we end uh, at, and at 7 o'clock. You end your 11-hour urine collection. We give you another bottle. You take DMPS. You take three capsules, relatively small capsules, not as big as the multivitamin ca uh, tablets you probably take, uh, with some water, uh, and you take your DMPS. Then you begin your zero to six hour urine collection. At 11 a.m., because this, I, I'm always the first guinea pig in all our experiments, so I know that at 11 a.m. you're gonna be starving. You haven't had anything to eat since the night before. So we give you a turkey sandwich and fruit. No Coke, we don't wanna pick up metals, all right? Remember, there's no coffee at breakfast. We don't want caffeine to be interfering and be a confounding factor in these experiments. At 1 p.m., if you're the first one who started, you end your zero to six hour urine collection. You have a physical exam to see if anything's changed about you. Uh, you also get a free physical exam. You're not being charged for this. And another blood for clinical chemistry. We tell you now, we'll send you the results of clinical chemistries so you know whether your blood cholesterols are high, your sodium's high, or whatever. So you're getting it free. This doesn't cost you anything except your goodwill. Now, to put it entirely a different way, more colorful, away, DMPS Mercury Challenge Test. This is a test we do routinely in Mexico and Chile and other places. Your diet, two weeks prior to arriving in Tucson, in your case, should exclude foods such as seafood. Seafood, as you know, has a lot of can have a lot of mercury that are known to be high in mercury. Other medications disqualifies you. If you're taking any other medication on a daily basis, we ask that you don't participate. Uh, the reasons are good research reasons, and we don't want to have interactions of drugs. If you want your mercuries done, and all 125 don't want them done, you just want your urinary mercuries done, we'll try to cooperate. But you won't be in the study officially. You won't be in the study. Vitamin, we, we prefer that you don't take them that morning, all right? Uh, we, but we don't want you vitamin deficient, of course. But we would prefer that the day, for the 24 hours that we have you, that you're relatively free of any other drug. The only thing we haven't said it no to is smoking, but uh, not very many people smoke anymore. Few do. Okay, so that, this are, we're now forgetting the, 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 the actual hours, but to give you an idea, minus 11 hours, begin fasting, begin urine collection, water will be supplied ad libitum, ad, ad libitum, seems like there's a wrong spelling there. No breakfast, no coffee, nothing. No breakfast. <laughs> Just want you to know what you're getting uh, involved in, all right? Minus one hour. Begin physical exam, vital signs, et cetera, at zero hour empty bladder, take blood sample, give 300 milligrams DMPS, zero to six hours, collect urine cumulatively until six hours, plus four hours, subject receive turkey sandwich, six hours, and urine collection, et cetera. We have done over 100 of these when you consider all the various places, probably 150 of them now. We have never had a chemical reaction, okay, We've, as far as anyone adverse reaction. All right, now, that's essentially the Tucson study that we'll want to have your cooperation with. And at some time, Michael Ziff and others will get together, we'll, I should get together with them, and we'll put, through, put together a protocol which hopefully will be mailed to you and we'll ask you whether you want to participate. We probably will not be able to take everyone who wants to, assuming everyone will, will because we're gonna to try to match using various demographic data age and other things, the, the periodontists and orthodontists, the general practitioners, and you, 
okay? And you are a very important part of it. All right, now let me tell you about some of the results that we have gotten using DMPS as a challenge test. And actually, I have Murray Vimy to thank for all this, you know. I had no interest in mercury. I'm a clinical toxicologist. I'm not a clinical I'm a toxicologist now. I do a lot of molecular biology. And one day I get a phone call. I'm on sabbatical in Del Mar, California, up here with my dear wife. And I get a call from someone, a group, saying, we would like you to find out whether amalgams are toxic. And I said, you know, I have no interest in amalgam toxicity. I have some amalgams in my mouth. I have, I'm on my sabbatical. I'm not interested. And they said, well, won't you just go through the literature and find out whether mercury from amalgams can get from your amalgams into your body. And I said, that's a ridiculous thing. Obviously, they can't. Everyone knows that. So why should anyone put something into your mouth if there's going to be mercury vaporized? Uh, and I said, I'm not interested. They said, well, please do it for us and for a variety of reasons. Uh, I said, okay, I'll take a couple of days since I have a wonderful wife who can find things in the library that no one else can find and uh, ask Mary to go ahead and come down to UCSD library, we're on sabbatical with them at the time, uh, to see what she could find. And the next day I called these people back and I said, you have a problem. And they said, why? Well, there's this paper by Vimy, a guy up in Canada someplace, and there, there's no contesting it. He took radioactive mercury, uh, added it to amalgams, and uh, he's done it with sheep, and I can't find this paper with the kidney that he's done. It's off in some journal that we can't seem to find. But uh, it, it's good stuff. And so I really, uh, as I go through this, this talk, uh, have Murray Vimy to, to blame for it. And uh, really, it's, uh, and as, as I say, later on, I'll buy him a, a, a drink, and maybe I should put some mercury in the drink with some arsenic. Uh, but uh, really, he's done fantastically good work. Uh, and I said that without even knowing him at the time. So the Arizona student amalgams. So what happened next was that we did get interested in all this. And uh, because of the work that our laboratory d had been done with, had been doing in chelation for a number of years, we were asked by another organization to see if there was anything to what they called the DMPS mercury challenge test, which was being used in Europe. We did not develop this test. I'd like to think we had perfected it, though. We did not originate it. I know there are one or two dentists in the crowd, so let me go through this, all right? The ordinary, first thing we did was go to my friendly dentist and say, what's an amalgam besides mercury? And he, what, what amalgam do you use? And in Tucson, Arizona, they use something, whoops. In, in, in Tucson, Arizona, they use something called the Valiant R PhD. Why it's not MD or DDD, I don't know, but it's PhD. And it contains 47.3% mercury and an alloy powder. The alloy powder contains, as most of you know, mercury, copper, uh, tin, and palladium. Now, normally, well, we'll come to that. All right. So our procedure, essentially, you've seen, we've got students. We advertise the college newspaper for students with and without amalgams. We wanted to see whether the, the, the MPS challenge test was a meaningful test. Uh, that we, we got undergraduates and we paid them $75 honorarium and they came and they fasted uh, without any problems. We collected urine from, in this case, minus 11 to zero hours. At zero hours, we gave them 300 milligrams DMPSPO. And we collected urine not just for six hours, for zero, one, two, four, nine hours. And then we determined the total urinary mercury. Again, since there are one or two dentists in the, uh, there, are one, there are one or two people who are not dentists in the crowd, and since this is a lecture that my friendly dentist gave me when we get talking about amalgam scores, I'm told a dentist looks at a tooth as a five-sided cube, with the bottom being under the gum. And I just want to point out that we have here now a restoration, if you will. A restoration, you have one, two, sometimes three, or even four sides. So he takes the largest diameter, the dentist takes the largest diameter of this uh, restoration if, it has, if it's one millimeter or less, he gives it a score of one, one to two, two, two millimeters or more, three. The summation of all this is the amalgam score. Prior to this time, I think most people were just using the number of amalgams, which we did not think was a good criteria to use. Uh, we thought we wanted the number of surfaces and the idea of the, of, of the 
size of the surfaces. The slide shows you the urinary mercury excretion after 300 milligrams of DMPS was given orally in subjects with and without amalgams. We're not epidemiologists. 10 is a good number for us for each group, all right? We don't need huge numbers. The black here are people who do not have amalgams in their mouth. It shows you the amount of, of uh, mercury excreted during each of these time periods. And from the baseline all the way up shows the amount of mercury being excreted after the MPS with students who had amalgams in their mouth. Essentially from this, which we've confirmed in other experiments we've done since, that over two thirds of the mercury in the body of these students and most people with amalgams is derived originally from the amalgams in their mouth. Uh, the mercury uh, in those people who do not have amalgams in their mouth is derived usually from their food, uh, from a variety of sources like seafood and other, other materials. For those of you who like numbers, you'll see that uh, the no amalgam group, the amalgam group uh, before DMPS, after DMPS, before DMPS, after DMPS, all quite significant differences. Now, this shows you, we want to ask the question, is there any relationship between the number of surfaces, amalgam surfaces, or the amalgam score, if you will, and the mercury coming out in the urine after DMPS? And this just shows you from the zero to two hour uh, collection that there is a fantastic correlation. If a graduate student showed me this data, I would tell them to go back and do it again. It's so good, it almost looks manufactured. There's one on each side, two and two, one to one, and all the ones down here without amalgams. But the correlation coefficient, which gives you an idea as to whether there's a positive linear correlation between this axis and this axis, between amalgam score and mercury after the MPS, is very, very high. It's 0.94. This is also true, 0.94, 0.94, of different time courses. Zero to one collection, zero to two hours, zero to four, zero to nine. Uh, when we published this, the publisher, the, the editor of the FOSAB journal put this uh, cartoon at the end of our uh, article, which is very unusual in a scientific, dull scientific journal, you know, to have some humor. And uh, I recently showed, as you can see, what do you mean you're not going to school? What's your excuse? My tooth fillings contain mercury. And I was recently uh, in Boston where I have two grandchildren, one five year, a little girl five years of age, and I thought I'd show her this cartoon, and I said, and, and Anna, uh, uh, Charlie Brown says, my tooth fillings contain mercury. And she said, granddad, you are, grandpa, you ought to know better. That's not Charlie Brown, that's Linus. And, uh, <laughs> Monterey Dental Mercury. We have set up a collaboration with a number of groups in, uh, with the in, connected with the Mexican government. They've been very hospitable to us. One of the groups is at Monterey in the Institute of Social Security Medicine Research. In Monterey, there is a beer, which I don't want to mention by name, which you all probably drank. It's a very good Mexican beer. Uh, and it's a very paternalistic company. They were very concerned uh, about the health care their employees were getting about seven or eight years ago, and they decided to build a new medical dental clinic, which we visited, and it's first class. It could be anywhere in this country. It would get an architectural prize in this country. Beer is a good business. Uh, they later were dissatisfied with the physicians they were hiring, and they gave $25 million four years ago to one of the universities in Monterey to start a new medical school. But what I want to point out is that no expense was spared building this building and equipping it. It could be any first class, uh, the, the dental examination rooms could be any first class dental examination room or suites in this country, with one exception, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we were asked to go down and see how their dentists were doing and their dental technicians were doing it, as far as mercury is concerned. Uh, could you lower that, please? Is that possible? This study was a DMPS challenge test in Monterey, Mexico. And essentially, we were supposed to have 10 dentists, but for a variety of reasons, five of them dropped out. All right? Five of them dropped out, to be very honest, because they're 
well, never mind. They, they dropped out with that. Nothing to do with the drug. Uh, the dental technicians were young women who, when our young woman physician who was with us asked them uh, to give her a sample of urine so she could do a pregnancy test, they immediately broke out in a blush. Uh, they're very sweet 18 to 21, 22-year-old dental technicians. They are young. That's what I'm trying to convey to you. They're not someone who's been in a dental's off, dentist's office for, 40 or, for 30 or 40 years. Uh, we're now plotting the urinary mercury per six hours after the MPS versus dentists, dental technicians, controls, all right? Pre, with the dentists, it increased about 44-fold, all right? With the dental technicians, it increased 88-fold. The mercury coming out after the MPS also shows you the uselessness of mer urinary mercury performed before a chelation, chelating agent is given. These values are not unusual, high or low. And essentially what DMPS does is it increases the excretion of the mercury from your kidney. Your kidney is a primary source, primary tissue, if you will, that holds on to mercury. It's not the only one. And the kidney has a fantastic capacity for mercury. But this is an indication of mercury exposure. All right? Now, why are the dental technicians so high? In this first class dental clinic, they have never heard of amalgam capsules. All right? Most of you know, again, for those who are not dentists in the group, most of you know that most dentists in this country who are doing amalgam work buy a capsule. The capsule is divided in two parts. One part of the capsule is the mercury, and the other part is the alloy powder. And when you put this into a shaker, a membrane which separates the two is broken. The uh, amalgam is formulated. You break open the capsule, and the dental technician then goes and gets it with whatever the instrument is called. I'm sure you know what it's called. And gives it to the dentist, and he starts doing the restoration. In this first class modern clinic, dental clinic, medical and dental clinic, in Monterey, Mexico, the technician in a room smaller than a closet, which contained a sink, but had no ventilation, the young lady would take a bottle of mercury, put a little bit on a filter paper, liquid elemental mercury, and then would take a little bit of oil of alloy, put it on the filter paper. And then she or Either she would do the squeezing or she would walk to the examining room and give it to the, to the dentist, who would then squeeze the excess mercury uh, through the filter paper. This, I'm told, is not done very often in this country anymore, although it used to be done maybe 20, 30 years ago. I asked the dental technicians when we were there what, she, what they did if they made a mistake. And one of them said, I throw it in the sink. Well, she throws in the sink with a trap and she washes her hands with hot water, of course she's going to be vaporizing the mercury. And uh, I asked the other, one of the other technicians what she did if she made a mistake. She said she just throws in the waste paper basket. All right? And this is why I think, or where I think they got their mercury exposure. The dentists obviously are better educated. They knew better. They're a little more careful. And it's purely an economic reason, or it was, as far as not, they're not having capsules. One of the satisfactions of being in this kind of work is that when we went back to give them a report, we don't get paid to do this sort of thing. There's always a Mexican toxicologist that we, we our, most of our work is supported by our federal government. Uh, but one of the satisfying things about this work is that you go back and you tell someone this, and this clinic then immediately called the construction people who began to put in a ventilation system, who began to take the sink out and to make tremendous number of changes because they were very concerned about these young women having this amount of mercury in them. So uh, it's really gratifying to see that there are industrial organizations, certainly, that do have some concern about the health of people. Now, another thing I want to point out to you is you don't have to believe a potion as far as what we think is going on. You can go to other people. We collaborated with Dr. John Woods. Uh, James Woods, uh, I'm sorry, professor uh, at the uh, University of Washington. I think he's spoken to this group before. He's an expert on porphyrins. And when we collected our urines before and after DMPS, uh, we put some aside for him to do porphyrin analysis. 
And he did, among other things, a coproporphin level. This is an intermediate, as you're in, in, in synthesis of heme. As you know, almost every cell synthesizes heme. Uh, it's needed for hemoglobin, uh, and uh, the enzymes are very susceptible to inhibition. And what we're able to point out was the amount of, co uh, of coporphyrin in the urine before DMPS, which Jim Woods had clearly shown to be indication of the, any renal damage caused by mercury in the kidneys. All right? We found that there was a very strong correlation between the coporphyrin before DMPS in these technicians and the amount of mercury coming out after DMPS. Again, correlation coefficient of 0.921, very high. And we were very pleased to see that we had confirming data. This shows, again, what I just told you, mercury, a DMPS after, micrograms of mercury after DMPS versus micrograms of coke proporphyrin leaders before DMPS, 0.921. No correlation between the mercury after DMPS and the copro after DMPS. No correlation before DMPS, uh, mercury before and before. So what we're trying to say is we think that our test clearly shows that there has been damage to the kidney as judged by the coporphyrin levels before we even gave the, uh, the agent. So we believe that we have a good biological marker for mercury damage to the kidney by this DMPS challenge test. Look, before we show the slide, let me also point out that we took down with us to Monterey at the time, Dr. Diana Echevarra. And we took the computerized uh, program. She brought four computers, three technicians. Uh, and the, the computerized behavior, neural be they're really neuropsychological tests. Some people don't like to think that a psychological test is done on them. So we say it's a neural behavior test. It's more compatible to more people uh, thinking about it. So essentially, Diana set up and did neural behavioral studies on the three groups of uh, people that we studied in Monterey, including controls. And she was very clear, <coughs> able to show there was a clear correlation between the amount of mercury coming out after DMPS, the amount of mercury coming out in the urine after DMPS, and the effects, the neural behavior deficiencies in what we call, uh, let me try to give you the term that we want to do. One is a, a motor, a, 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 a finger mobility test, if you will, and another is trying to connect numbers with figures. Again, this is all done on a computer. But essentially, it shows, her studies clearly show that first, for the first time, at these low levels, even at these low levels of mercury exposure, there certainly are neural behavior signs that we can measure, neural behavior performances that we can measure. And that's what we want to do on the three groups of dentists that will be part of the so-called Tucson study. Now, let me change the, uh, the subject just slightly and point out to you again, uh, to refresh your minds, that there are three different forms of mercury, three major different forms. We have, we have elemental mercury, what Vimy has clearly shown to be emitted from uh, dental amalgams in your mouth. We have inorganic mercury, mercuric Hg plus two. We have mercurous mercury, which when you went to school, and I still call it HG2Cl2, whereas this would be HGCl2. Uh, essentially, this is a relatively unusual, you don't see it very often in toxicology now. Uh, and we have organic mercury, methyl mercury, the mercury you get from fish most of the time. A couple of points to make before we leave this slide. Uh, the first point I want to make is that in a person who recently died in New Mexico, died about a year and a half ago, who had been subjected to organic mercury poisoning by eating contaminated, conta a contaminated pig, uh, and who had severe central nervous system damage, 20 years after she was autopsied, 20 years after she was exposed, when she died, she was autopsied, and they found that the amount of mercury, in this case, mercuric mercury, the organic mercury had been 
oxidized and curious mercury, in her brain was over 200 times greater than what was found in suitable control. So this shocked a great many of us to think that the mercury in such high levels could remain in the bread, in, in the brain for that long of time. That's an awfully long time, toxicologically speaking. What I want to talk to you now about is mercurous mercury. In Mexico, there is a skin lotion that contains mercurous mercury, caramel, if you will. It contains mercurous chloride. It is sold there and used to lighten the skin. It's a cosmetic cream, uh, both a cream and an ointment. Uh, we were asked, again through the Mexican government, uh, to come down and look at, with the cooperation of the factory owner, the workers in this mercury factory, in this mercury lotion factory, and the people who had been using it for over 25 years. Uh, again, we decided we would do a uh, uh, DMPS chelation test. And the next slide will, it was done in Tampico. And this slide, again, if we have it, the DMPS challenge test increased the urinary excretion of mercury in each group of the skin lotion study. <coughs> Essentially, the users. One of these women had been using this cream for over 25 years. This is a substantial, uh, tremendous increase in the amount of urinary mercury excreted over a six hour period. Uh, the makers, the factory workers, tremendous increase. One of these people we actually brought out in a six hour period, he excreted six milligrams of mercury. That's an awful lot of mercury. What's amazing is there were no signs or symptoms of mercury toxicity. We did not do the computerized test there because the, work, the factory owner was concerned about a whole bunch of computers coming down here and disturbing the workers and make them wonder where they should be working there. Again, the controls had almost nothing. Again, we want to point out that the factory owner did take our recommendations into account Places have been substantially cleaned up, although the lotion is still being sold uh, by, uh, by the company. Mexico has many of the same rules and regulations as far as toxicology that we have. Unfortunately, they don't have the means of uh, being certain that those uh, rules and regulations are enforced. Uh, this also just shows you, in case you're interested, the DMPS challenge test increased the urinary excretion. Lead in each group essentially points out that the, there's really no difference here, that even though their mercury levels were quite different, the, uh, the lead levels are not that different. All right. <coughs> Going to change the subject slightly. Uh, again, to point out some other studies that we've done with mercury. These are normal graduate students now that were studied over a 23-hour period. Again, a fast, a, uh, and then for every hour, each hour they uh, empty their bladder into a bottle and tremendous amount of work analyzed. What I want to point out is that people differ. Here is an individual who's excreting more than 20 micrograms of, uh, of mercury each hour for at least four hours. And here is a Chinese student of ours who was excreting only two. And so everyone's going to vary. The profiles that we get are very important to us because they give us an average of a large number of people. All right, we've done the pharmacokinetics uh, of this drug. Uh, again, we have an IND. We, not we, the company who makes the MPS, eventually, we have no financial interest in this company at all. Uh, the company, it's a German company, that would like to see it introduced in this country and the FDA has certain tests that they insist on being done before they're going to approve any drug. And one of them is pharmacokinetics. What happens to the drug? How long does it stay in the body? How long is it excreted? And this is the IV preparation that was given because IV preparations were available, and therefore we could take advantage of them. And you can see that this is a log plot versus time, that after uh, the injection of DMPS, what we call unaltered DMPS, or parent drug, no change, is excreted very quickly, but the altered drug, or total DMPS, which we call it now, takes at least six, more than 60 hours to come down. In fact, 
as far as the uh, percent of the dose recovered in the urine, we took it out to almost 90, it took out to 96 hours. And this, the unaltered form comes out very quickly. The drug itself stays in the body for quite some time. Well, we can, well, maybe we might want to see that. The drug stays uh, in the, uh, this tells you the time of elimination. How long does it take for half the drug to, uh, uh, how long does it take for the drug to leave the body, the T1 half, if you will. We call it elimination time. 1.8 hours uh, for the unaltered DMPS and for the total DMPS is 20. Uh, okay, what happens to this drug in the body? Again, just go over this very quickly. We have to devise ways of just finding out what form is the drug when it comes out in the, in the urine. This is the formula for DMPS. This is another molecule in yellow, and in the urine, these what we call disulfide linkages are formed. And we also form polymers here, three of these molecules in a polymetric form. Uh, before I say one or two more things, I'm almost through. I just want to point out that uh, what we call in our lab, the golden people, the young people have really done the work. I'm just a loud speaker for them. Uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Myrino, Dr. Dodd is our physician, as well as Dr. Herbert, both are board certified. A uh, number of people have collaborated with James Wood. Uh, Diane Echevarria's name, yeah, there she is, uh, are, who will be present to do the studies. By the way, Jim Woods will also be there in the Tucson study to follow the problems. And these are our Mexican collaborators, uh, uh, Diego Gonzalez and Pablo Junco. Now, before I go on to the next slide, which I want to be certain it is. Yes, all right, we'll stop there. Fine. If I could have the lights, let me now talk about legality again. I've had a number of calls from a number of people uh, about using DMPS. Uh, it is my understanding, and uh, perhaps someone here will, uh, we, I know we have a lawyer. I think we have a lawyer in the audience, yes. Oh. Yes. It's, is this better? Okay. It's my understanding of the laws about drugs are as follows. That if a drug is not approved by the FDA, then the only people who can bring it into this country is the patient himself who's allowed to buy that drug in a foreign country and transport it into the United States for use by his physician for that particular patient, number one. Number two, it is my understanding, and you know, I'm not here in adverse, as an as a, uh, as a, uh, antagonist, let me assure you, uh, uh, but I feel that for malpractice reasons and other things, that people should know this. It is also my understanding that a dentist, it is illegal for a dentist to give a drug like a chelating agent especially if it's not even approved by the FDA. Now, it is all, I've been told that, well, a physician has the ultimate right to decide what drug, what therapeutic agent should be given to his patient. The Food and Drug Administration says that is absolutely true if we have approved that drug for anything in this country. If the drug has not been approved by the FDA, then it is illegal for a pharmacist to deal with it. It is illegal for a physician to deal with it. However, again, as I said early, it's very easy to get an IND There's, from the FDA. The FDA has a very large office which deals with physicians and dentists, and they're willing to spend time with you. And I'm just urging you to not put yourselves in jeopardy. Uh, we have an IND, uh, it's not hard to get. I also want to point out that the preparation that we use is a Western preparation. That is, it is made by a German pharmaceutical house which is under the supervision of its FDA called the BGA. It ha is inspected, I visited there, it is inspected. Uh, it is different from another preparation. And I know that when I first got here, someone showed me a circular that was being handed out on some table as far as a DMPS preparation. 
which is essentially a Soviet preparation. I would urge you to be very careful. If you want to use the MPS illegally, which you can do for, by yourselves, that's, that's your decision to make. But if you're going to do it, be certain you use one that has been formulated using the best technology available to the Western world. Uh, the other preparation, there can be questions about because there are Soviet preparations, which certainly were not under the, the strong regulations, inspections that the Western world drugs are. So let me just summarize by saying I've told you part one. The next part is going to be in, in Tucson, uh, in which I'll tell you more about DMSA. Part, uh, what I want to talk, just summarize by saying I've told you about a chelating agent that can be used orally. IV preparations are also available. The oral preparation is relatively free of adverse effects, relatively. The IV preparation of any DMPS product, no matter who makes it, is subject to the following concerns. One, if you inject it quickly, you will get hypotensive effects. As I said, I was a guinea, I'm always a guinea pig for the first experiments on my lab. My young people refused to give me DMPS IV because as they said, your heart is older than ours, and if you had a slowing of your heart and stopped, it might be just as slow responding to epinephrine. So if you're going to give DMPS IV in the form of a bolus, you should do it over a minimum of five minute period. You ought to have an EKG uh, tied up to the patient. We do that routinely when we use the IV preparation. Also, if you give it IM, the Soviet li literature is full of reports that IM preparations can result in necrosis at the site of injection. Again, this is not seen with the oral preparation. Both of these drugs, or both of the forms of this drug, are available from the Heil Company in Berlin. They plan to, hopefully, to get a new drug application to have it approved in this country, but it can be purchased outside the country. Uh, the use of it is relatively safe as far as oral preparation to you get an idea of the body load of mercury. And that's what most people want to know. DMPS, which I didn't say, does get into cells. The evidence in our lab and from other labs clearly shows that one reason why DMPS is effective is that it gets into cells. It can cross the cell membrane. It does not cross the cell membrane as readily as dimercaparil and other compounds, and that's one of the very reasons why it's not as toxic. Most, uh, just about all the work I've, been, I've told you about today has been published, whether it's ours or from other laboratories. It's readily available uh, in the scientific literature. Uh, nothing that we do is secret. Everything is up, up and above board. And if there are any questions that I can answer for you, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you.